we're going to, for the next couple weeks, uh, be speaking on the importance of imitating the humility of Christ. The importance of imitating the humility of Christ. How many of you know that a lot of times when we talk about imitation, we think of that as a bad thing, don't we? When we think of imitation, we think that that's uh, the, not, yeah, or making fun of somebody, or maybe it's uh, uh, if you're making a recipe and you use imitation, you think of that as being like cheaper quality ingredients. Or you think of uh, imitation as being unoriginal. You'll say, well, he's just imitating that other preacher, or he's just imitating that other person. And a lot of times we think of imitation as a negative thing. But do you know the Lord told us to imitate him? Believers are supposed to imitate Christ. Christ is not an example to the lost. Christ is an example to believers. Because the lost don't need an example. They need a Savior. But once you've been saved, then you're supposed to start imitating Jesus. Amen? So we're going to speak about imitating the humility of Christ. Because when we imitate Christ, what happens is that the substitute is actually better than our original. The substitute is better. That's what Jesus did. He came to be a substitute for us. He substituted Himself. His sinless life was substituted in place of our sinful life. His humility was substituted in place of our pride. So the substitute is better uh, and when we're talking about imitating Christ. And we, wanna, we want that to be our goal and our aim, to imitate Christ. Well, humility can be learned. Sometimes we think of humility as something that just has to kind of happen in our lives. But according to a, a verse we're going to read, in just a minute, humility can be learned. We can learn it through imitating Christ. Through imitating what Jesus did, we can learn to be humble and receive the benefits of humility and also uh, do the good works of humility in the world around us. Uh, we're going to focus in on one verse. We're going to go to many. But we're going to focus in on one verse in this study. And that's uh, Matthew 11.29. You can turn there if you want. And Jesus said there, He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Did you hear those words? And learn from me. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So that means humility can be learned. It's not something that we just have to catch. We can teach ourselves to be humble. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then he goes on to say, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. A lot of times we think of humility as a, as a huge sacrifice. It's a lot of work to be humble. It's hard to be humble. And sometimes that's true. But Jesus said that if we properly understand humility, that it'll actually be a rest for our souls. Did you know humility can be a rest for your soul? Not just a sacrifice, not just a hard thing you do. Well, this is all wrapped up in this verse. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, once again. Jesus said, red letters, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Well, I heard a story of a, a mother that was having a lot of trouble with her girls. They were fighting like cats and dogs, and Christmas was approaching. So this young mother thought that she had just the most brilliant plan to fix the problem. And she uh, told her girls, she said, you know, Santa Claus only brings presents to good little girls. He doesn't deliver presents to girls that are being naughty. But the fighting just kept on going and kept on going. So she had this brilliant idea. She called her sister-in-law and, uh, you know, made like it was Mrs. Claus. And her sister-in-law was very upset because everybody knows that at Christmas time, Santa and the elves and Mrs. Claus is very busy and you shouldn't be disturbing them at Christmas time. And so she persisted with her sister-in-law, and finally Mrs. Claus said, okay, Santa can speak to one of the girls, but he's very busy. It'll have to be a very quick conversation. And so her, her brother got on the phone, pretending to be Santa, and she handed the phone to her three-year-old daughter, and Santa scolded her very sternly. He reminded her, I'm watching you and your sister, and I want you to know that it's only the good little girls that get presents from Santa Claus. If you girls are wanting presents, you better quit being naughty, and you better be good little girls. And well, by this time, the three-year-old was shaking and crying and kind of getting upset, and the mom thought, uh-oh, I've gone too far this time. So she took the phone and pleasantly ended the conversation with Santa, and she said to her three-year-old daughter, honey, why are you so upset? What did Santa have to say? And her three-year-old daughter cried, and she said, Mom, I'm afraid Big Sister's not going to get any presents. 
See, it's, sometimes it is hard to be humble, isn't it? But it doesn't have to be hard to be humble. Humility can be a rest for our souls. Okay, so first of all, uh, what is humility? Webster's Dictionary says that humility is preferring another person above yourself or thinking of yourself less than another person. That's a good definition, but we're going to focus more on biblical definitions. Though that is a good one. To prefer other people better than yourself or to think of yourself as less than other people. The Bible has several different variations of the word humility. We're not going to go through them all because there's actually a, a number of them. But this verse is the best definition of humility in the New Testament. These words of Jesus. Jesus puts two words together in the Greek. And uh, depending on your translation, uh, Jesus said, I am gentle and I am humble in heart. Uh, or he said, I am gentle and uh, lowly is what some translations say. Uh, in heart or in spirit, but he put two words together for humility. The first word was the Greek word preus, preus. Okay, and the word preus, which is that word uh, rendered uh, gentle in most of your translations, means to be of a mild disposition, gentle in spirit, and to be meek. Uh, some translations may use that word meek in place of gentleness. So Jesus said uh, in the Greek, he said, I am preus, I am preus. I am gentle, I am meek. But there's something really interesting about that Greek word, preus. Uh, what it means, uh, basically, is that you're not going to defend yourself against a false accusation. That's according to the New American Standard Greek lexicon. It, it carries the idea of not defending yourself against a false accusation. Jesus said, I'm very preus. How many of you know that, that there are times that you do have to set the record straight? When you have your opportunity, you can speak and set the record straight. But you shouldn't have a lifestyle of always having to set the record straight. The lifestyle of Jesus was to be very preus. To be very much uh, not even wasting time on false accusations. Okay, Because how many of you know false accusations are going to come? And this is the quality of just relegating yourself to understand that my Heavenly Father is going to take care of me. Uh, it doesn't matter what man says of me. As long as my heart is right with my Heavenly Father, God is going to take care of me. And that's the disposition that Jesus had in life. We can learn that disposition. We can learn to be preus. We can learn not to retaliate uh, when there's false accusations, when there's attacks. This is a very good church, and there's not been a lot of that here. But, but I tell you, I've had some uh, churches where there's a lot of, uh, of uh, false accusation happening. I used to always pray, Lord, get them. <laughs> I remember one time we were roofing, and uh, I was putting some of the shingles on on my own, and I was so mad. I was up there pounding them nails in, uh, saying, Lord, get them. You're, I know I'm right on this thing. You better get them. But how many know you can be right and you can be wrong? <laughs> Amen? And, and we don't have to defend ourselves. There's something very beautiful about not defending ourselves. Just letting your quality of life speak. Now there's a time, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be a doormat when you have the opportunity to set the record straight. But uh, I'll tell you, you can get wrapped up. You know, I like what uh, Sean Hannity says. Sometimes I listen to him on the radio when I'm driving. And he says, I don't even read what the newspapers say about me. He said, why would I want to read what a bunch of people I don't know have to say about me? You could get online and you could find all kinds of stuff about Sean Hannity. Maybe some of it's true. Maybe some of it's not true. But just imagine how quickly he would go off the TV, he'd go off the radio if he got wrapped up in that stuff. Just imagine if all of a sudden he, had, he felt like, I have to defend myself against every false attack. Could you imagine? You couldn't function. Especially if you had any kind of influence or prominence, you just couldn't function. You have to learn how to stay on task, how to stay on target, and be very preus. And realize that faith, a lot of times, is just trusting that the Heavenly Father is going to bring out the truth. That He's going to defend you. If I've messed up, I'll repent, I'll apologize, I'll do what I can, but I don't have to walk around trying to defend my reputation all the time. Preus, that's a wonderful quality that we can learn. But Jesus put it together, the word preus, he also here in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, put together with the word tapenos. And this tapenos is a Greek word for humility that means not to rise very far from the ground or to be of low degree. And that's why some of your translations rendered that word as lowly rather than humble. But it is a, a word for humility, and it means to be of low degree, not rising far from the ground. Now, Jesus wasn't saying 
that you have to walk around like the scum of the earth, that you have to walk around lower than a worm's belly. That's nothing what he was saying. What this word tapenos means is that you're choosing to be of low degree, meaning that you're not thinking highly of yourself. How many of you know this was a characteristic in the life of Jesus? You see, they came and they wanted to make him king, remember? But it wasn't time for him to be king yet. Oh, he is the king, and yet he made himself of low degree. You want to find that king? You know where you go? You go to the, the drug addicts, you go to the harlots, you go to the streets, the homeless, and you'll find that king. He became a king of low degree. That's the Greek word tapenos. And Jesus put these two words together. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. See, that's where the emphasis is at in this. Learn from me. For I am very preus. I don't defend myself very often against false accusations. And I'm very tapenos. I'm of low degree. I spend my time with the least. I didn't come to seek out the righteous. I came to seek out the sinners. Tapenos. That's humility. One time the Lord convicted me because I walked into a room and you know I was trying to be very humble. And I, I thought, I'm going to find the least important person I can find in this room to sit with. Now that, that seems spiritual, but I, I did that. I walked in and immediately the Holy Spirit convicted me. And He said, how do you know that you're not sitting with the most important person? Hey, because God doesn't look at least and greatest like we look at least and greatest. See, I could walk into that room and think I'm doing some big public service by sitting with the least important person, and you can learn and have a wonderful relationship that you'd never get any other way. You see, God looks at things different than we look. Jesus said we can learn these characteristics. Uh, we can learn to be preus, not defensive of ourselves. We can learn to be tapenos, associating with low degree. Go back to that word preus. This just kind of is occurring to me. There's no association with this in the Greek. But I like preus, pray us, right? Pray us. And when people are falsely accusing us, instead of defending ourselves, we should pray us. Preus, pray us. And uh, there's no association with that in the Greek. That just came to me real quick. But preus and tapenos, he puts them together. This is the biblical definition of the humility that Jesus told us to take upon ourselves. And he said, if we'll do this, we'll find rest for our souls. As a matter of fact, if we take that yoke upon ourselves, it'll actually take the load off. Amen? Okay, so as we speak about humility, there are uh, some misnomers about humility that we got to break. But I'm going to look at just three of the big ones. Okay, again, Matthew 11, 29. We're going to just be saying this verse over and over this week and next week. Okay, so I want you to just let this sink in. He says, Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now that one verse breaks a whole bunch of misunderstandings that we have about humility. First of all, sometimes we think if we're humble, that we can't speak about humility. Have you ever felt like that? I know I have. You feel like, well, as soon as you start talking about humility, then you're not very humble. I like in uh, one of the books of Moses, Pentateuch, and it says, Moses was the most humble man upon the earth. You know, and I always think, how did Moses write that? And how did he say he was the most humble man upon the earth? It's okay to talk about humility. You don't lose humility just because you talk about it. That's a misnomer, a misconception. It's wrong. It's false. You don't automatically lose your humility when you talk about it. Because remember, look at this verse here. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. What did he say? He said, for I am gentle and humble. Well, Jesus talked about it. And right before He talked about it, He said, learn about this. Learn from Me. Learn from Me what it means to be humble. And then in the same sentence where He says, learn from Me what it means to be humble, He talks about humility. See, that's a misnomer. Sometimes people think that if I speak on humility, I, I've just lost it. I can't think I'm humble and I can't say that I'm humble. If I do that, then I've lost my humility. Well, that's just false. It sounds good. It's convicting, but it's false. You can have false humility that way, but it doesn't necessarily mean it. Okay, another one of these uh, things that we can break is that sometimes we think that you can't know that you're being humble. Well, humility, when we learn it well, will become second nature. We won't walk around always thinking 
look, I did a wonderful sacrifice. I did a wonderful deed. But you can know that you're being humble and still be humble. That's a misnomer. That's false. I know I was taught that a lot. That Well, you better be humble, but, but you better not know that you're being humble because if you know that you're being humble, then it's not really humility. Well, Jesus said here in this verse, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Okay, same sentence again. For I am gentle and humble of heart. He knew that he was being humble. He emptied himself of his privileges of being God. But he knew that he was being humble. He didn't, he, he, what he did, he did as a man. He, Jesus walked upon the earth as a man that was full of the Holy Spirit. He emptied himself of his privileges of being God. That's in uh, Philippians 2.7. We won't go there this morning, but it, it says that he emptied himself. He knew what he was doing. Jesus had to know that he was being humble. He says that nobody took my life from me, but I laid it down willfully. Jesus knew that he had emptied himself of his divine privileges. He knew that he was humbling himself. He knew that he was laying his life down willfully. This wasn't something that caught him by surprise. But he did it for our sakes. He knew he was being humble. And he was humble anyway. You can uh, speak about humility and still be humble. You can know that you're being humble and still be humble. And here's a big one. The third one. I have some experience with this one. You don't have to cry to be humble. Can you say amen to that? You don't have to cry to be humble. Tears can be associated with repentance and humility. Just because you cry, it don't mean you're repentant. Just because you cry, it don't mean you're humble. Man, if I could get people to understand this. You know, uh, it says that Esau wept with many tears, and yet he didn't find repentance. Esau cried and cried and cried, but yet he didn't truly repent is what that means. He didn't find repentance. I've had so much experience with this of uh, people that would come into my office and they would cry, but then they'd go out to do the same thing. I know about one man, uh, I'll be very vague about this in case this recording ends up in the wrong hands, but one man, uh, the pastor told me that this person came to them in tears saying that they were repenting of adultery. They were in tears. They were very broken in his office. And the pastor said, the first thing you have to do is put away your mistress. And the man said, well, I can't do that. That's not repentance. You see, tears don't mean humility. I like worship, and, and worship can really touch the heart. And, you know, if you're feeling emotional, cry before the Lord. Let, let it come out. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'll tell you, I, I, in previous churches, had worship leaders that could cry all the time, and yet they could speak with razor blades, like they got razor blades in their mouth. I mean, that's not humility. We can't do that. So humility is a humble disposition. You're not restricted from understanding you're being hum humble. Uh, you can speak about humility and still be humble. And it's not just restricted to tears. Uh, okay, Jesus did weep. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept in the Garden of Gethsemane with many cries and loud shrieks, it says in the Bible. Uh, he did weep, but he was also very joyful. Wasn't he being humble all of his life? Jesus, could we say that Jesus wasn't humble when he multiplied the fish and the bread? I mean, I mean, imagine that. Multiplying fish and bread. I mean, that would get you some time on TV, wouldn't it? And yet Jesus was humble when he did that. He did it twice. He didn't lose it. He didn't do it once and then lose his humility. And he, oh, you can't. Jesus, you already did that. Now you can't do that again because you got proud the last time. That didn't happen. Jesus walked in humility. It was a humble disposition. It says in Isaiah 53 2 that he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty, no majesty, no majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was just humble. <laughs> and he says that we can learn that same kind of humility. We can learn to be humble. This is important stuff. Okay, so we can learn how to talk about humility without becoming proud. We can learn how to know that we're acting in humility without becoming proud. We can learn how to walk in a humble disposition without having to cry all the time. Again, nothing wrong with tears, but they're not necessarily a requirement for humility. Okay, so... What we've looked at so far was we've seen the definition of humility. Okay, as Jesus defined it, it was uh, not defending yourself, trusting the Father to defend you, 
and it was being of low degree, meaning that you're not too big for your britches, you'll associate with the low degree. That's how Jesus de defined it. Uh, we've seen that there are some misnomers about humility. We've seen that you can know that you're humble, you can speak about being humble, and you can be humble without crying all the time. Okay, we've seen that. Now, what I want us to look at is how Christ lived a humble lifestyle. Jesus lived in humility. And he's saying, if you'll learn how to do this, it'll take the burden off. It'll take the load off. Uh, matter of fact, there's nothing that'll take the load off as much as learning to live a humble lifestyle. Nothing. We can pray, but there's always going to be something we forgot. There's always going to be more time we can spend in praying. There's always going to be more time reading the Word. Uh, those things are all very important disciplines, but we, there, there's a point at which we can never do that stuff enough, and there can be a big burden because of it. Okay? But if we learn to live a humble lifestyle, like Jesus describes humility, it'll always take the load off. It'll give our souls rest. We're going to see that. First of all, He was born humble. In Luke chapter 2, we listened to that in Sunday school. Jesus was born humble. Aren't you glad for that? Now, see, sometimes when we got bad mannerisms or we eat with our mouth open or dress funny, people say, well, what's your problem? Were you born in the barn? And uh, they're, they're making fun of us when they say that. But Jesus really was born in the barn, wasn't He? A cave, which was the barn of the day, but he really was born in the barn. He was really placed in the manger. He was born humble. Okay, he chose to be born humble. We talked in Sunday school how Jesus, one of the reasons he took the name Jesus is that was a common name. And he's the Savior of the common man. Aren't you glad that Jesus was born humble? <laughs> See, we, we maybe didn't get to choose how we were born physically, but we can be born humble spiritually. I have no problem with saying a person got born again meaning that they got saved. I have no problem with that. We're used to that terminology. Uh, most people that speak English know what that means. They got born again. I, so I'm not trying to split hairs and cause a problem here. But if you want to be strict within the context that Jesus used the word born again, He was speaking to a religious person. He was speaking to Nicodemus. Jesus didn't go out and speak to the drug addicts, the prostitutes, the sinners about being born again. The act of regeneration absolutely was there. But he didn't use the words born again with them. We've coined that. We've said, okay, that's a born again experience. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not how Jesus used it. When Jesus used the word born again, he was speaking to a religious leader. And what he was speaking about specifically was he was saying, Nicodemus, how do you not understand this? It's time to be born again in your thinking. Read it. Read the story. Nicodemus came to him in the night. He was one of the leaders of Israel, one of the religious leaders of Israel. And Jesus told this person that I guarantee he was in the synagogue every time the doors were open. He was at all the prayer meetings. He was at all the fellowships. He was at everything. He, he loved God. There was no doubt about that. That's why he came to Jesus. That's why he came and sought Jesus out. He had a heart for God. And Jesus tells this religious person, he says, hey, you want to enter the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. Now, let me tell you, when you're already at the top of your game, being born again means you're starting over. You're starting over in the way that you think. You're starting over in the way that you uh, uh, approach these things. See, that, that requires humility. To be born again requires humility. There's another person, we can see that at work, the Apostle Paul. Remember when he was Saul? Now, I don't know... But a lot of people that uh, study history and study the Bible, they say that even if Paul would have never got saved, the world would have known who he was. Because Saul, you know, he was advancing uh, flawlessly in the law. Uh, actually, the Bible says that he was flawless in the law, but yet something was still missing, wasn't it? And uh, he was advancing, and he was known, and he was prominent. And here he was at the top of his game, advancing beyond all the people that are like him, zealous for the Lord, religious, Always in church, always not just in church, but, but doing the law outside. And here he was on this Damascus road when he had an experience with Jesus. And guess what this religious man had to do? He had to get born again. He had to start all over. How many of you know that we can be born again and start all over? I don't care if you've been saved for 85 years. You can be born again today in your thinking. That requires humility. Let me word it this way. We don't have to go through and destroy everything we've been taught. We've been taught a lot of good things. A lot of good things we've been taught. Hold on to those. But maybe 
we need to look at some things as the Holy Spirit shows us with the confirmation of the Word. We're not on our own here. We're talking about the Word of God. We need to look at some things and be reborn in our thinking. You say, well, I, I already know everything. I've read that book ten times through already. You know, I, I already know all of that. Well, it takes humility to be born again. How many of you know that Jesus was born in humility? Sometimes we got to start over in some things. I'll tell you, I've many times I've studied the Word, because I like to just study the Word. I mean, I could literally spend all day long, every day, studying the Word. I mean, I love the Word of God. That's, that's the truth. And sometimes I've studied the Word, and I've put a sermon together, and you don't know how many times I've spent hours on that sermon, and you know where it goes? <laughs> In the trash, if you're lucky. It goes on the shelf if you're not for another time. But the Lord don't care. I mean, yes, yeah, study to show yourself approved, but the Lord don't care about all of our effort. Sometimes we just got to start over in things. And that takes humility. We can be born again in humility even if we've been saved for many years. Okay, Jesus was humble in His lifestyle because He was submitted to His parents. He was submitted to His parents. It says in Luke 2.51 that He went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, but His mother treasured all these things in her heart. Now, remember what happened here. We were again talking about this in Sunday school. They were coming back from the temple and they had gone three days before they realized Jesus was even gone. I like what Leon said. You know, we'd notice two hours later if our kids were missing. How did they go three days without realizing that Jesus was gone? But you see, it just shows us how easy it is to go about everyday life without the presence of Jesus, doesn't it? Because it's the way that we've always done it. I'm sure that they were just doing what they always done. They're not bad people. God wouldn't have given Jesus to them if they were illegitimate parents. I mean, you know, I mean, they were good people. God entrusted His own Son to them. How would you like to be responsible for the Son of God and not realize He's missing for three days? <laughs> but, but they were just going about their normal business. They were just going on like they always do. And one day they realized the presence of Jesus is gone. We better go back and find Him. He's right where we left Him. And they found Him in the temple doing the Father's business. Uh, I've Perhaps said it before, but if you're lost, sometimes if you're wondering why your life's a mess, maybe you need to go to church because maybe Jesus is in there. He'll fix your life up. You don't know how many times people, I talk to people that know better and their life's a mess, their family's a mess, their finances are a mess. And you say something like, when's the last time you went to church? Well, a couple years ago. You want to know where Jesus is at? He's, he's right in the church that you grew up in that you haven't been to for a lot of years. Go find them in there. Some people need to hear that. Some people, their finances are in a mess. And, uh, oh, I don't know why God don't help my money. You want to find Jesus? Go put your tithes in that you haven't been putting in for six months, a year. You'll find Jesus doing His Father's business. But then there's the other side. There's us that are the faithful. Because I know we all say amen to that, right? Amen. Because that's pitchfork Christianity again. You wouldn't be here if that applied to you. To us, what the Lord says, sometimes we can go about the normal business of church and not realize the presence of Jesus is gone. We've had our Bible study, we've had our worship, prayed and anointed and done all the stuff that we do in church, and yet, where's the presence of Jesus? And Jesus to us is saying, hey, guess where I'm at? I'm in the nursing home. <laughs> Lord, why haven't you been here for two or three weeks? Well, come to the nursing home and find me. Lord, where, where are you at? Well, why don't you uh, uh, come out and uh, do something for somebody that don't deserve it? You'll find me. Because he's always about his father's business. Jesus submitted to his parents. After they came back to the temple and found where he was at, it was then that it says he was obedient to them. Now, we know that Jesus lived a sinless life. We believe that and affirm that. This is the one event that we have recorded in the Scriptures that people can say, well, Jesus, or they try to say sometimes, Jesus sinned. He he disobeyed his, parents, disobeyed his parents. He went to the temple. They didn't know he was there, etc., etc. But he didn't disobey them. When I listen to that story or read that story, I don't see Jesus disobeying them. I just see uh, that they forgot about him. They left him. <laughs> Jesus didn't sneak out and go there. They left him there. What it looks like to me. But when they came back for him, Jesus obeyed. 
And that's pretty good for a 12-year-old, because how many 12-year-olds think they're 22? That's pretty good, especially uh, when the people were listening and they were impressed with him. And uh, he, didn't, you know, he didn't go on to, to the voice or something. Jesus went with his parents. He obeyed his parents. That's humility. To be 12 years old and know that you really do know more than your parents, and you have to submit yourself and go with your parents, that's humility. Jesus was also uh, humble in the fact that he was raised in an average family. Matthew 13.55 says, this is one of the accusations, they say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? So the family was ordinary. I believe that Mary and Joseph were fine people, or God wouldn't have entrusted them with his son. But the family was still ordinary. If you really are reading the book, if you've read it through a few times, you'll see how ordinary the family is. Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him at that time. If you remember, just before Jesus went up Palm Sunday, his brothers were challenging him, and they were saying, why don't you go up to this festival? They were mocking him, making fun of him. There's no public figure that comes to prominence in private. Hey, Jesus, if you're the big stuff, why don't you go up? See, it was a normal family like any other family. One time, Jesus was teaching and healing many people. And it says that, that his parents and his, well, it doesn't say parents, it says his family thought he was out of his mind. They thought he was crazy. And they went up to get Jesus, thinking he was out of his mind. And the people came in, they said, Jesus, your mother and brothers are here. They're here. And he said, my mother and brothers are the ones that hear the Word of God and keep it. You see, he was humble, but he also wasn't bullied at the same time, was he? Because they were coming to get him because they thought he was out of his mind. But he was raised in an average family. Uh, if Jesus were born today in the flesh, then I'm sure that you know his father would go to work and come home, and his mother would probably work. and It would just be an average, ordinary family of good people. When I say ordinary, I don't mean broken it wasn't a broken family, but it was still a family. Amen? <laughs> He'd probably be born in a family like mine. It's a glorified mess. <laughs> beautiful mess, a hot mess, some people say. You know, it's beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm just going to pontificate a little bit here. Oh, now Delaney's coming out. She hears me talking. Uh, I'm blessed. I mean, I, I, you don't know how much I thank God that I don't have to deal with kids on drugs, that I don't have to you know, deal with weekends at this parent, weekends at that parent, that I don't have to... You know, I am so blessed and I know it. And yet our family's a mess sometimes. <laughs> it's a beautiful mess. You know what I'm saying when I say a beautiful mess? Sometimes I sit, I can't sit in the kitchen because the noise reverberates off the wall. I'm, I'm being transparent here and I just got to get out of the house. I got to go somewhere. But I love every one of them and I know how blessed I am. And I wouldn't want to go home one day without that noise in the kitchen. See, that's how Jesus' family was. He was just, the people said, his sisters marry among us. His brothers live, who does this guy think that he is? But Jesus didn't defend himself. He just kept his nose to the grindstone. He just kept on target. He didn't get pushed around, but he also didn't defend himself at the same time. He was raised in just an average, ordinary family. And when I say average, ordinary, I mean a godly, blessed family. Ordinary in that sense. Okay, Jesus became poor to reach the lowest man. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, so that you through His poverty might become rich. Jesus became poor to reach the lowest man. He didn't have to. And by the way, if you read that verse, it says that he became rich. He, I'm sorry, he became poor so that we could become rich. It's not just talking finances. It's talking about rich in life, blessed in life. But Jesus became poor. He bore our poverty. He was humble in that. He was humble in that he reached the lowest man. Now, back when we lived in Los Angeles for a short time, years and years ago, uh, Mr. T was still known. I haven't seen him for years. You guys know who Mr. T is, right? From the A-team with the big mohawk. Well, Mr. T is a preacher. Not everybody knows that, but he's a preacher. You know, he was still kind of known. And he would go down to Skid Row and places, and he'd preach the gospel. But what he would do, you know, one of the things he's known for is all those gold chains and necklaces and earrings and all that stuff. But he said, when I go into the house of God, he said, I don't wear those things. He took them off. 
because I'm, he's not there to be a show. He's there to worship God. But when he went down to Skid Row, he would wear those because people recognized him that way. And they would all come now out, you know, in the inner city, and they'd want to see Mr. T and see all of his gold chains and necklaces. But when they'd come out, he'd preach the gospel. He knew he was being humble. That really spoke volumes to me. I really like that. When he goes to church, he said, I'd take them off. I don't wear my gold chains and my earrings in the church. I mean, a little bit of respect is hard to find sometimes nowadays, isn't it? Okay, Jesus submitted himself to temptation so that we can know that he understands our trials. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. What's powerful about this, uh, as James Dobson has said, we're not who we think we are. Did you know that? You're not who you think you are? And we're not even who other people think we are. Who we are is who we think other people think we are. So in other words, most of the time, if I think that Leon thinks about me a certain way, then probably I'm going to live out that way without even realizing it. If I think Leon thinks a certain way of me, then I'm going to act like that without even realizing it. It's just a subconscious thing. We're not who we think we are. We're who we think other people think we are. Well, Jesus submitted himself to temptation so that we could know he understands our trials. Now, if we have a right understanding of Jesus, we can be who we think he thinks we are. Well, this is powerful stuff. How many of you think that when Jesus thinks of you, he's thinking about that old dirty sinner how many of you think that when Jesus is thinking about you, He's thinking of you know, all of your flaws, all of your shortcomings, all of your failures? Well, you know it's hard to live a Christian life like that. Because you're always thinking God's trying to get you. You're always thinking, I'm just going to mess up again. I'm just going to sink lower than ever before. But if we understand what God really thinks about us, if we understand that He was tempted and tried for us, he knows. Sometimes I don't know why I do what I do, but Jesus knows why I did it. He understands more than I understand why I do what I do. And if we understand how He thinks about us, that He thinks we're great. You know, He thinks you're so wonderful, He wants to spend eternity with you. He wants to marry you and be with you for all eternity. Uh, there's an old saying, some people, uh, they used to say this up north, they would say, would you fish with Him? And that meant, do you like Him enough on your personal time to fish with Him? And that, but Jesus would fish with you, wouldn't he? he? Man, he is always available. He's always uh, He's not the one wanting to spend less time with you. We're the ones that don't. I mean, we could we could devote our entire life to doing nothing but spending time in the presence of Jesus. And I don't fault those people that have done that. God calls different people to different things. And if a person is sincere in their love for God, they could devote their entire life in a monastery seeking the Lord, and the Lord would never get tired of them. He thinks wonderful things of us. And He knows what we're going through. We, you know, he, he was tempted in every way that we're tempted, even though He didn't sin. Amen? Well, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. We'll come back to some of these next week. We don't have to get them all in a week. Again, looking back at our theme verse here of Matthew 11:29, He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We're called to emulate Christ's humility. Okay, we'll take the other half of the life of Christ next week. But we're called to emulate Christ's humility. The hard part isn't learning about humility in the life of Christ. That's the easy part. The hard part is emulating that humility. Imitating that humility. Acting it out in our daily lives. And that's the clincher of all this. We are called to learn how to be humble like Jesus was humble. First of all, He says, take my yoke upon you. That means that we choose it. You don't take something that you didn't choose. Think about what the yoke was. The yoke was put on the oxen so that they could pull the plow. Jesus didn't force His yoke upon us. He says, if you'll take my yoke upon you. See, it's a choice. We have to choose that we're going to learn how to be humble like Jesus was humble. He gives us what we need, the help of the Holy Spirit, and He also gives us the Word of God. We've got the material that we need, but we have to take the yoke upon us. Now, the good thing about taking the yoke upon us is that when we put His yoke upon us, we're no longer pulling alone. See, we have to take it, but by taking the yoke of Jesus upon us, we're no longer pulling alone. So, 
even though it's sometimes hard to imitate and emulate and learn the humility of Christ, we have that assurance that if we'll take His yoke upon us, that He'll start pulling with us. Aren't you glad that He's not going to give up on you? That He's never going to quit on you? You can just get up again. You know, I think sometimes uh, the Lord's just blessed by people that care. He's not uh, so concerned about your success as He is just your faithfulness that you endure, that you get back up. James 4.10 said, Humble yourself before the Lord and He'll lift you up. There are great benefits of humility. It's a principle of preference. When we will take the yoke of Jesus upon us and humble ourselves, there are great benefits of humility. The human mind says, no, you got to defend yourself. you got to promote yourself. you got to lift yourself up. That's the only way you're going to be anything. But God says, take my humility upon you. Don't defend yourself. Don't be of high degree. Be of low degree. And if you'll do that, if you'll take that upon you, then I'll lift you up. How many of you know that if God lifts you up, it's a secure place? But if we're lifting ourselves up, it's a pedestal that you better watch out once it gets knocked out. You see, but we've got to take His humility upon us.